Hey guys, welcome back to the channel where I cover missing persons, unsolved cases, crime news, and more. I watched most of the first day of the Ashley Benefield trial, Florida against Ashley Benefield. And I'm just going to go through the opening statements in this particular video because it's already kind of long. They actually weren't long considering some of these cases I have heard opening statements from. But we're just going to go over that so the video is not too entirely long. So uh, let's jump right into it with the state's opening. This case is about a woman who very early on in her pregnancy decided she wanted to be a single mother. And she did not want the father of this child to have any visitation, her husband. And everything she did from that point on was to attain that goal. And she would stop at nothing to attain that goal. She tried several things in the system that you'll hear. The courts, law enforcement, Department of Children and Families, no one got on her side. And at the end, when there was no other option, she shoots him and kills him and claims self-defense. Now this couple, Doug Benefield and Ashley Benefield, were married. They had moved to Florida from South Carolina. They lived together in South Carolina. Now when they lived down here in Florida in Bradenton, they did not live together. Obviously, there were issues. Um, Doug Benefield lived in his own apartment. Ashley Benefield lived with her mother, Alicia Byers, in a home with their daughter once she, had, once she gave birth. She had this daughter, who at the time was a toddler, when she shot Doug. While they were living separate, they were still interacting with each other with the goal, the apparent goal, of seeking reconciliation reconciling this family and, and becoming a family. They were going to restaurants, they were going to Selby Gardens, they were hanging out at the pool at Doug Benefield's apartment complex. By all, all images, they looked like they were trying to reconcile. The problem was, that is not what Ashley Benefield wanted. Although that's what she was portraying, that's not what she wanted. At the time that this shooting happened, they were planning to move to Maryland. Ashley's mother had inherited a home in Maryland and they were gonna to move to Maryland. Doug was also gonna to move to Maryland. They were gonna to continue to live separate and continue to attempt to reconcile, but they were all going to move to Maryland together. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the time that this happened, Everybody was in moving mode. There were boxes everywhere, furniture, you know, beds up, upended. Uh, they had a U-Haul that they were using together. They had a pod that was in the defendant's driveway that they were putting all of their things into. And every day around this time, Doug Benefield was going to Ashley's home to assist her in putting these things into the pod, putting these things into the U-Haul, because the plan was that they were all going to pack up in the next few days and move to Maryland. And it continued to try and work on their relationship. The problem was Ashley Benefield knew that this was a ruse. She didn't intend to reconcile. She didn't intend to try to make this work. And the problem was there was a court hearing on September 30th of 2020. And at that court hearing, all of this was gonna come out. It was gonna come out that she was acting one way when she was by herself, and she was acting another way when she was with Doug Benefield. That she was telling him she wanted to work on things, that she wanted to get this marriage back together. But yet, when separate, she was saying she had absolutely no intention of reconciling, did not want him around, um, and, and did not want this to work. On the 30th of September, this was going to come out. On the 27th of September, she shoots him and kills him. Three days before this hearing and three days before this information was to become public. Now, there was no one else at the house at the time of the shooting. It was just Doug and Ashley. Um, while Ashley's mother and child lived there, they had gone to the park. As soon as Doug got to the house, Alicia Byers takes her 
granddaughter, and they go to the park. So the only people at the house are the defendant and the victim. And you're going to hear three very important things about this shooting. Number one, Ashley Benefield was the only person that was armed. It was her gun. She had it from before. It's not like she took it away from Doug. It was her gun. And Doug Benefield was not armed. He had no gun, no knife, no club, no weapon of any kind. Number two, Ashley Benefield was not injured. Law enforcement took pictures of her right after the shooting. And then again, you'll hear in a few days, they took more pictures. Because sometimes law enforcement, they know that bruises sometimes don't show up right away. That it takes several days for these bruises to show up. So they took pictures several days later. And you'll see those pictures and you'll see that Ashley Benefield is not injured. She has some very superficial scratches on her midsection. Um, who knows where they came from? She had cats in the house. Who knows? But this is the only injury to her. And the third thing is the trajectory of the fatal bullet. Now, he was shot multiple times, but one of the bullets was fatal. The trajectory of that bullet was side to side. It was not straight on. Doug Benefield was not facing her, coming at her at the time that the fatal shot was fired. Now, as you go through this trial, it's a lot of information, a lot of timeline, but it's all very important to understand the tenor of this relationship between these two people. And it goes all the way back to when they met um, back in 2016. That was the end of August 2016, they meet. They were both involved in some political event and they met. 13 days later, they married. Doug Benefield was 54 years old. Alicia Benefield, or excuse me, Ashley Benefield was 24 years old. So there was a 30 year age gap between the two of them. They knew each other 13 days and they got married. Ashley Benefield was very into the ballet had been an ex-dancer. Her dream was to start a ballet company. And lo and behold, her husband has the money and the connections to get this job. So he begins and she begins to put this ballet company together. And they do put a ballet company together, but before it can actually take off, it falls apart. Before they're married even a whole year, so in April of 2017, Doug Benefield has his vasectomy reversed because they want a child. Within weeks or months of the vasectomy reversal, the defendant is pregnant. So all within a year of being married, they have done a vasectomy reversal gotten pregnant, started a ballet, and the ballet has crumbled. While Ashley is pregnant, she decides she's too sick from the pregnancy, morning sickness, and that she needs her mother to take care of her. Her mother's in Florida, in Bradenton, Florida. So during her pregnancy, she moves to Bradenton, Florida to live with her mother so her mother can take care of her during the sickness. The two never lived together again. This was the last time these two lived together. They continued a long distance relationship when she first moved to Florida and um, continued trying to keep it together in communication. But about the same time as the ballet collapses, right about all of this time, Ashley Benefield starts complaints against the victim. Her complaints are things like, the main one was that Doug Benefield was poisoning her with heavy metals and her unborn child was being poisoned, that there was poison in her tea, that he was giving her poison. 
There were also other complaints, domestic violence complaints, um, different types of complaints, but not once will you hear that she ever said he hit her. Not once did she ever say he choked her, kicked her, anything like that. Even though she's making these complaints, the victim, Doug Benefield, is still trying to make this work. And you're going to see some text messages and hear some things. He's still trying to make this work. But she is having none of it. So at about the time that she's ready to give birth, Doug Benefield contacts an attorney here in Florida, Sarasota, Florida, Stephanie Murphy, and asks her to help. And asks her to help him write a letter to her, to Ashley Benefield, to state that he wants to be a part of the birth and he wants to be a part of this child's life and to please keep in contact with him. Ashley never answers that letter. That letter is sent via email on March 15th of 2018, which was several weeks early. She wasn't due yet. And the next day, she is induced, her pregnancy is induced, and she gives birth to a daughter. She never tells Doug. He doesn't even know his child is born for weeks. And she never responds to the letter. The way that Doug knows that this child is born is that Ashley Benefield starts filing complaints again. And based on these complaints, he figures out, oh, my child's born, and now we have more complaints. The complaints revolved around the poisoning and the things that I talked about earlier. And she filed for what's called a violation of injunction, or I'm sorry, she filed for an injunction. An injunction is our legal way of saying restraining order. So... When someone wants a restraining order, they have to go through a process and go to court, and the court has to decide, and, and you get a restraining order. So that was her process. She was trying to get a restraining order against Doug, and the allegations were what I said to you. At the same time, Doug Benefield had not seen his child, had not met his child. So he did a cross complaint to say, please let me have contact with my child. <laughs> I've never even met my child. So this was set for a hearing, and it ended up going two days. It was, it was long. It was a long process, a lot of witnesses in family court, and it ended up going two days. It began in July, July 30th, 2018, and it finished on September 17th, 2018. And at the, at the conclusion of that hearing, the judge said no. No, you are not getting a restraining order, and no, you cannot keep this man away from, your child, from his child. And granted Doug Benefield immediate visitation with his daughter. He met his daughter for the first time. She was six months old. And at the time when they were exchanging custody, which was at the sheriff's office for meeting the child, um, all of this animus had been going on. I mean, they had just had these hearings and, and all of this. And at that first time sharing, that's what they call it nowadays in family courts, time sharing. At the first time sharing, Ashley starts becoming very nice to Doug and says, basically, I'll go with you for the visitation. And that's what they do. The, f the family goes off for visitation. And that begins a year approximately a year, of basically them working on the relationship, um, going out to restaurants, doing things, uh, hanging out together as a family. About a year. Now, Doug never moves in with Ashley. He keeps a separate residence. But after almost a year, so around August of 2019, Ashley just stops talking to him. Just stops. And that's about the time Doug files for divorce. He finally says, okay, we're getting a divorce. Then what you'll hear is that the defendant started a whole new set of complaints. You will hear that she was involved in five different complaints, all revolving not around her this time, but about the child. Because now Doug has visitation with the child, so now these allegations are that Doug's abusing the child. Um, okay. And... 
The allegations are that Doug's abusing the child. What you'll hear is that not one of these charges was ever prosecuted. Not one of these charges ever um, left law enforcement. So the defendant now has tried these five complaints after Doug filed for a divorce. Law enforcement's not helping her. No one has said that Doug cannot see this child, so there's still um, visitation going on. And in this, in this meeting of all these people, it was decided that Doug and Ashley Benefield will go for a psychological evaluation. So they do. And they go to Dr. Broder, and Dr. Broder does a very extensive psychological evaluation. And he meets with them together, he meets with them separately. He meets with them with the child, whose name is Emerson, by the way. She's a, a little girl. And at the time of the shooting, she was about not yet two years old. During this evaluation, and what you'll hear from Dr. Broder, is that Ashley Benefield acted very different when she was with Doug and when she was not with Doug. When she was with Doug, it was, we're moving to Maryland, we're going to work on our relationship, we're going to try and make this family work. When she's not with Doug, she's saying, no way, no how, I do not want this, I don't want to reconcile with him. And to Doug's knowledge, all he's hearing is, I want to reconcile. So that's what he knows. That report was coming out at that hearing on September 30th, 2020. So September 30th, 2020, Ashley knew the ruse was up. Now, there had to be a request from both sides, the husband and the wife, to release this psychological report. And at one point before the hearing, Ashley Benefield tried to get Doug to drop that so the report would not get out, would not be released. Doug refused. So that report was coming out on the 30th, and on the 27th, she kills him and claims self-defense. Now, you're probably going to hear a lot of information about Doug Benefield. Probably some negative things, not so nice things. I would just ask you to remember who's saying them and why. Just because someone speaks words does not make it true. So use your common sense as you go through this trial. This is a long story with a lot of information, but you'll see that this was a custody battle, that this mother was going to win at all costs. And the cost was the life of Doug Benefield. And that is murder. Thank you. All right, so... That is the state's opening. Uh, I have to say, initially, when I heard this this morning, uh, I wasn't as impressed with her opening. And re-listening to it, I got more out of it. So, um, I'm starting to change some feelings, personally, on Ashley. Uh, the state basically is claiming that Ashley's two-faced. She would be one way around Doug acting like everything is going to be great. She wants to rekindle and do all these things and that they were going to work things out and then or not around him. She was a completely different person. So it was sort of like she was bipolar. And, uh, and at the time, you know, of the shooting, she was the only one that was armed. He had no weapons and she had no injuries. Only, only Doug had injuries and he was actually shot from the side, he wasn't facing her at all. Uh, so, and so definitely there's a lot of uh, questions as far as what exactly happened in that home. Considering it was the only the two of them, it really is a he said, she said, uh, as well as the forensics and what have you. Uh, the whole, the whole relationship between them, I think that that was a lot of the problems, you know, but they met in 2016, as she stated, uh, he was 30 years older than her, 54 years old, and she was 24 at that time. And then they only, they only dated each other for not even 
14 days, 13 days, and they got married. Uh, and then, and then, you know, a year in after doing all this, you know, exciting stuff together, she decides that she needs to go and live with her mom in Florida. So she had all these complaints while they're not living together, uh, that, you know, she's being poisoned. She was, you know, a victim of domestic violence. So she doesn't even tell him, tell Doug that she gave birth to their child. And he only finds out because she starts filing more complaints and allegations against him. And he doesn't finally meet his daughter until she's six months old. Uh, the bottom line is it was a very strange relationship. Uh, he thought that they were, they were going to be rekindled. She kind of went through another period where she was telling, you know, acting to him like, oh, we're going to be a family. Everything's going to be great. Uh, but that's not how she wanted it. And, uh, he started filing the divorce papers and, uh, then she claimed, oh, let's, you know, make up and, you know, let's move out together again. And, uh, again, lots of lies and just, he said, she said, uh, and again, I don't know what evidence that we have. I'm very interested to see what the state has, but she's definitely got a lot of allegations and complaints against Doug. And then from what the state says, she killed him because she didn't want anything to do with him in their daughter's life. So that is pretty much, you know, the state's, uh, you know, case, their opening statement. So let's move to the defense's opening statement. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Douglas Benefield. He was 58 when Ashley Benefield was forced to shoot him. Can I see the second picture, please? I want you to note how he's built for a 58-year-old man. Now, despite being raised by a family who taught me that it was ill to speak about the dead in an unflattering sense, I'm going to have some strong words about Douglas Benefield, the alleged victim in this case. I say alleged victim because he was anything but that. The evidence is going to show that Douglas Benefield was a very disturbed man. Of that, I assure you, you'll have no doubt when the case is over. 30 years older than Ashley, he was obsessed with her. And he successfully portrayed himself as everything he was not in an effort to win her hand in marriage. Despite promoting himself as a religious, honorable, and decent human being, Doug Benefield was a manipulative, cunning, and abusive man who insisted, absolutely insisted on control. Among other things, you're going to learn during this trial that over the course of this four-year relationship, Douglas Benefield did the following. He fired a handgun into the ceiling of their kitchen on an occasion to stop Ashley from talking. He threw a loaded gun at Ashley. He punched their dog in the face so hard that he knocked the dog unconscious. He regularly carried a concealed firearm that was racked, meaning pulled back and ready to fire. He unlawfully placed a tracker on Ashley Benefield's vehicle. He was regularly observed following Ashley Benefield in her car driving in 
Manatee and Sarasota counties, despite the fact that he was living in South Carolina, having driven all the way just to tail her. He was caught by a neighbor at night standing in the neighbor's backyard in an effort to peer into the Ashley's house. He punched numerous holes in the drywall of their home when they lived together in South Carolina. And he had a previous marital history of domestic violence. Ashley Benefield was painfully aware of all of this on September 27, 2020, the day of the homicide. And I want to assure you that this is not going to come to you from just one place. These are acts that were admitted by Douglas Benefield himself. Ashley Benefield feared him. That was no secret, ladies and gentlemen. She left him a letter when she moved out three years prior to the homicide detailing how scared she was of him because of all of these acts. She feared for herself and for her unborn child. Three years before the shooting. She left him, he pursued her. She rejected him, he would not take no for an answer. She at times despised him, he did not care. She moved to get away from him, he followed her. She decided to go to Maryland, surprise, he decided to go to Maryland as well. She belonged to him, he had the right to be with her, and no less than God decided that to be the case. Doug Benefield viewed Ashley Benefield as his property. Abusers seek to control their victims, to dominate them. At times, the pressure that Doug Benefield exerted and brought to bear upon Ashley Benefield was so overwhelming that it sometimes triggered questionable suspicions in Ashley's dedicated effort to protect herself and her child. Domestic violence victims have several things in common. Number one, who ruled? Number one, they initially believe things will get better. <clears throat> Instead, they get worse. Number two, domestic violence victims develop a get along, go along attitude. It's the mentality because appeasement keeps the beast <clears throat> at bay. Just do what he wants and you'll be safe. These domestic violence victims constantly speak about walking on eggshells. And the reason they describe it like that is for fear of anything that they say may trigger a reprisal by the abuser. And if children are involved, everything is magnified. They become hypervigilant. Ashley Benefield developed all of those characteristics. So on 9-27-2020, the day of the homicide, Doug arrives at the residence of Ashley Benefield. And as you heard, they are living separately. He does not live there. He never resided there. This is at her home in Bradenton. He had no claim for entering that home on that day except with the permission of Ashley, which she gave on that day because she was moving to Maryland and Doug was going to Maryland as well. But he knew, make no mistake, 
as the prosecutor has told you, Doug Benefield knew full well on that day that this relationship was over. They were not going to be living together. Maybe, hopefully, they could work out some type of co-parenting agreement, but she was done. So how does that day's events unfold? What happens that results in us all assembling here this morning? It starts, ladies and gentlemen, with Doug Benefield once again seeking control. He is simmering when he arrives at Ashley's home on that morning, that afternoon. Why is he simmering? He's on a slow boil, actually, because he knows that Ashley's moving. He knows that this relationship is over. And immediately there's a discussion about how they should pack the belongings, with Ashley taking the position that her belongings should be packed last. Why? Because Ashley's things are going to be unloaded first. And Doug will then continue on to wherever it is that he was going to reside. So, this is the most vulnerable time for a domestic violence victim. When the abuser recognizes that he's about to lose her. So what's his response to this? All right. Classic tactics of an abuser, they are threats and intimidation on this afternoon as the two of them are trying to pack this U-Haul in this pod. In the effort to avoid confrontation with him, Ashley says after a short while, gee, you know, I'm really pretty exhausted. Um, why don't we stop for the day? Uh, we can finish tomorrow. Doug ignores it. His response is to grow increasingly aggressive and hostile. Not once, but twice, Doug body checks Ashley. And by body check, I mean he passes her in a hallway, slams his shoulder into her shoulder, almost knocking her over. That's not enough. The next thing is, as they're passing in a hallway, he's carrying a cardboard box. He jams the cardboard box into Ashley's side, which leaves scratches that the police photographer took. Again, now fearing for her safety because she sees how he is escalating in his behavior, she tries to persuade him, look, Let's finish for the day. It's getting late. I'm tired. No go. Instead, Doug bellows, I know what you're doing. You're trying to get me to leave. I'm your husband, and I can spend the night if I want to. Well, that was enough for Ashley. She heads for the front door of the house to leave. Doug chases up to her, grabs her by the arm or hand, and spins her around so that his back is to the front door, blocking her from leaving. And he yells right in her face, where do you think you're going? Ashley, desperate at this point, Doug yells, you can't leave me. Ashley somehow finds the strength to summon up the nerve to say, I am done. You need to leave now. She commands him to leave the home. Terrified while in his grasp, because he spun her around, his response is to smack her upside the head. And you'll see the pictures of her swollen face and her eye. And he yells, I am not done. Fearing for her life, 
as this was the first time that he had actually struck her. Up till then, it was always threats and intimidation. As intimidating as firing a gun may be to get you to stop speaking, he had never actually hit her. He'd pushed her. This time he struck her. Terrified after this, fearing for her life, she heads for her bedroom where she has a firearm. She gets to the firearm. She turns around. She orders Doug to stop. When she looks up, he's in the doorway. Instead of seeing the gun and leaving, Doug gets into this warrior pose with his arms moving purposely and advances. At that point, petrified, she fires, believing that if he gets a hold of her, she will be either seriously injured or killed. To her horror, after firing, he continues to advance. She absolutely panics. She tries to get away and backs to the side to create more distance between them, but there is no place left for her to go in this small bedroom. At that point, in utter panic, she keeps firing the gun. She sees Doug's legs go up in the air, almost as if he was running and slipped, and he falls backwards. Instinctively, she flees the house and heads next door to John Sant's house. He's a neighbor. When all of a sudden, Doug, ladies and gentlemen, and the testimony and the evidence is complete. The only thing that's going to have been established here beyond a reasonable doubt is that Douglas Benefield was a violent abuser. Ashley Benefield's efforts to placate him was absolutely consistent with what abused women do especially when a child is involved, and that Ashley's result and resource to deadly force was absolutely justified under the circumstances. Thank you. So that is the defense's opening. Uh, obviously, they are the defense is that she's a DV victim, and that she feared for her life. And he's stating that Doug was a violent abuser, and there's uh, supposedly all sorts of uh, stories and evidence to uh, to prove that he he forced her to shoot him that day, uh, coming after her. Uh, after chasing her to the front door, slamming her, and she runs for that gun. So fearing for her life, they have a struggle, and then she fires, and he ends up on the on the floor. The bottom line is again, it, she's supposedly a DV victim. I I hope that that is the case. I we hear stories all the time though that they use that as an excuse because this is obviously her defense that she. That she shot him to protect herself and she was a victim of an abuser uh and uh he damaged the house apparently he stalked her he tracked her vehicle supposedly he punched their dog in the face knocking it out uh, he threw a loaded gun at her and uh again this is the, her side of the story what her attorney uh mr taylor just told the jury today and uh, I think that, you know, we have to see where the evidence leads us. Uh, I, I like that I came into this, you know, so late because I'm kind of seeing it from this point of view. And the opening statements are always enlightening. And then we go through the witnesses. 
I'm not going to cover any of the witnesses on this one because it's already going to be uh, kind of long. But I will go through um, in the next couple days. I'll go through um, his cousin. Doug had a cousin. He was the first witness today. Um, his his daughter, who was 15 at the time that he met Ashley, uh, she uh, they, he was a widower. His wife um, had died, and then there's also. Um, other folks that they went through uh, today. Uh, the next door neighbor was a vital one and then they played that 911 call. So those will definitely be uh, what I'll go through for the first witnesses uh, in the next couple of days. So let me know what you guys think so far just from hearing these opening statements. Do you think that, do you think Ashley Benefield is a victim, a DV victim, or is she, is she a liar? Is she uh, full of herself? And all this stuff, you know, is stuff she made up. And uh, she's really not the victim. Doug was the victim. Obviously, it can't be both ways. One of them is lying. And uh, we're only getting her side of the story because he's dead. But we can see the evidence and, and folks around, uh, around him are able to tell some of his tale, some of his stories, uh, what he lived. But... She's here and she's able to tell her side. I don't know if she'll testify. That's always something. It's I'm always curious if these if these defendants will testify. It's always interesting. But she's got that uh, sad puppy dog look on her face today, and I'm sure that that was coached. It's always coached. Uh, and uh, her community, a lot of her community, is very supportive of her. But I was sort of convinced yesterday in the last couple days looking into this case that she was the victim no i'm not so sure and also i've heard some of the first witnesses so all right guys i hope you have a great rest of the day and most of all stay safe